Hello and welcome to another episode of the Everything EV podcast, a podcast dedicated to everything electric. I'm your host, Charlie Atkinson, and in each episode we'll be discussing everything to do with electric travel, whether it be electric cars, bikes, boats, or even planes. We'll be speaking with people from within the industry to get their thoughts on the growing EV sector, and we'll also have other features such as electric car reviews, electric motorsport coverage, and much, much more along the way. This podcast is available on every streaming platform, so be sure to subscribe to wherever you get your podcasts from to ensure you receive every single episode as soon as it's released. In this episode, we'll be joined by Jordan Brompton, the co-founder and CMO of My Energy, a renewable energy firm which created the innovative Zappi Charger, the world's first solar EV charger. My Energy was founded in 2016, and since then, the company has grown and grown, and Jordan is with us today to tell us all about it. So, Jordan, welcome to the podcast. First and foremost, could you just share the story of your business, the background to it, and where the idea came from? Yeah. So um, myself and Lee met about 10 years or so ago. He actually had a little business manufacturing an eco device um, that diverts power to hot water tanks, just like our Eddy product now. Um, And I went to work for him. I was a Zumba instructor at the time. And uh, what else was I doing? (laughs) Voluntary radio presenting and all sorts of just random stuff. I was at that age where I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I met Lee and just stumbled across this little business in Binbrook that I just thought this is amazing and I wish I'd been involved in it from the very beginning and just really found my passion and love for the renewable industry um you know I used to go on trade shows for him and bring in some of his biggest accounts and um it was sort of when the solar we call it the solar coaster in the industry when it crashed and all the feed-in tariffs were cut all of our customers went out of business overnight and we had shareholders at the time and they wanted to you know, end the the business and go in the separate directions. But Lee really wanted to continue. Um, I'd moved on at this point because the the industry had gone pretty flat and I I was gutted because I loved it. But I went and set up my own business in cycling distribution, which is totally random. But I had a French friend who was mad passionate about bikes and he had um, um, relationships with people in France and companies in France that weren't distributed to the UK so like ceramic bearings and chain rings and things like this and osymmetric chain rings and I had to learn this whole new world and I brought in some of their biggest accounts so like um, Wiggle, Chain Reaction and, and, I, and I was a shareholder in that 50-50 shareholder but Lee tapped me on the shoulder a couple of years later and said look I want to start a business and uh, you know I, I know how much you loved it and uh, you brought in some of the biggest accounts she was always you know saying how you wished you'd been involved from the beginning so do you want to do you want to join forces and I was like oh my god yes this was in 2016 and like I loved bikes well I loved the industry but it just didn't do my soul any any good it wasn't as good as what the renewable industry felt like I genuinely buzzed off solar and um doing something that I felt was more positive for, for the future and it just excited me more so I put uh what was it 20 2016 I was getting married in the September and a honeymoon in October and in November I just like came and I'd sorted everything out with the previous business and I just threw myself into it whole hog whole heart um and soul from November 2016 the first year we were literally an R&D business just we had a few engineers handful of engineers me and Lee um uh, you know, we were sketching out the brand, what the products could look like. The engineers were getting the products working on the bench. And um, I started reaching out to the industry. Like we went after solar installers initially because I had quite a good relationship with some of them and a few wholesalers and said, look, if we make these products, would you be interested? I mean, we literally started from scratch because Lee had no manufacturing equipment, <laughs> only a few loyal staff and um, a completely new a, a completely new brand, which is now which is my energy. And this was only five years ago. So we we started with what we knew, which was power diverter and home energy management within the renewable industry. So we developed a whole new product that we knew would be fit for the German market. So if you've got solar panels on your roof, you can divert that power to somewhere more useful, like a, a hot water tank or underfloor heating, towel rail, because really when you've got solar panels, you want to keep your grid at zero. So that is our main purpose and what we try to achieve is to essentially make you off grid but whilst being on grid and a lot of people can't afford batteries they're quite expensive and you've always if you've always got a hot water tank connected it just makes use of that spare energy um so we divert it to there 
And then Lee said, wouldn't it, he was driving a Nissan Leaf at the time, which I loved, by the way. It was such an epic car. Um, we got it all branded up in our branding logo, in, in our logo and everything, and with our little alien character. And he said, how good would it be if I could charge this directly off the solar and, um, you know, do do similar what we do with the Eddie, but in, in, the, in a car charger. It was like, it'll be niche of a niche, but... I think we should make it. And I was like, oh my God, we should make it. Cause I love cars and loved the EV space and loved that we could bridge the gap between um, renewable energy and electric cars. We looked on the, we looked on the market and there was nothing doing it at the time, you know, four years ago, all there was, was just standard sockets on a wall, smart charger. The term didn't even exist. Mm. So we developed the Zappi and it wasn't niche of a niche. It was bloody popular it seems to just we hit the the timing was perfect we hit the market with the right product and what ev drivers have been looking for and we just gained this amazing momentum and this um this sort of like real amazing following you know that we're really passionate about it that appreciated what we were doing out of out of grimsby and lincolnshire that we was manufacturing you know we don't just assemble these products we do full manufacturing it's not just screwing a lid on you know buying something from the middle east or china or wherever and then screwing a lid on and and selling it to the uk we manufacture the whole lot and the whole process and we've gone from six people to just well i think there's, there's well there's over 200 people as we sit here today and uh, with the new building being built to facilitate our growth and um, a whole new host of products and being worked on loads of other products that we're getting working on the bench that's actually quite a nice segue into my next question obviously that's the story so far for my energy, but I was wondering if you could paint a picture of the sort of size and scale of the company at the moment. Yeah. So at the minute we're spread across two sites. So we started in Bimbrook, which was, I think it's, I need to get my facts right, but I think it's only like 5,000 square foot in total that we've got there. And we, we manufactured 65,000 devices out of that unit. We were crammed in and then we obviously needed um, space and the pandemic hit and obviously you can't all work closely together, social distancing and all that jazz. We was like, now we've got to move. But there was nowhere, there was nowhere um, local to us, like commercial property seems to be going crazy. Um, so we started way before the pandemic hit, we'd, we'd agreed to build this new factory um, with the support of our local council um, in a place called Stalinborough, which is still Grimsby, but just on the outskirts of Grimsby. And um, we said we'd be their flagship factory on a green business. They want to make it a green business area. And um, we started building it and that's 15,000 square foot. So obviously like three times bigger than what we're in, not two mm-hmm. times bigger. I'm crap at math, bigger. <laughs> and, um, after about a year, we were like, this is too small. Um, we've agreed to all of this, but it's too small. So now that is just going to be, we put another floor into it and it's just going to be our office. We've actually saved the land next to it and going through planning permission for a 45,000 square foot warehouse. Um, so we're building a headquarters that we're moving into in July. And at the same time, this huge factory and we're reserving land because we already think we're going to outgrow that Um pretty quickly as well but we obviously needed space during the pandemic so we the council helped us and they moved us onto a retail park um in Grimsby so it used to be like a you know a Wix building that sold like kitchen parts and bathroom parts or whatever it is they sell um they moved out and it was this empty warehouse 35,000 square foot and I remember walking into it and going how the hell are we going to fill this this is mental we're taking on too much we, we're bursting at the seams again now so we need this we're split across three sites so we're building a site we've got our offices in Binbrook and our R&D and we've got our production facility in Grimsby um we, that's where the huge chunk of our staff is because it's um production staff 50% of it is production 50% of it is um office I mean yeah it's clear to see but it is a really exciting time for yourself and for the business at the moment One thing I just wanted to touch on just off the back of that is obviously you mentioned when you had the idea and you did some research into it, it seemed that it was quite a niche market, whereas in actual fact, there was quite a few different companies getting involved. Did you have any reservations in becoming involved in an industry that was becoming increasingly saturated? Yeah, I mean, it it was a fear, of course. And we actually like, it's quite a funny story, but we actually got laughed at by a competitor and I won't say who, but a natural thing to do is to go to somebody and like look at partnering, you know, because we were so new, we were funding it ourselves and we thought we had this amazing idea for car charging. And we, we essentially got laughed out of the room, like no one cares about solar 
no one cares about um, how they charge. They just want to charge. Like we're box pushers. We want to sell units and why we're going to put this tech into our product sort of attitude. And we were just like, whoa, okay, well, we're just going to go ahead and make it anyway ourselves and we'll be the judge of that and we'll see. Um, and because, you know, timing has a lot to play in it. We were lucky in the sense of it was, we were the first, first movers on it. Cause I think it would have caught on eventually. But because we were the first movers and because we managed to carve our like respected name into such a busy industry, it's given us so much insight and we focus on the home and the home energy management. Whereas this like the rest of just EV charges, if you look at them, mainly focus on just EV charging. A few of them might load balance the home, but really what happens if you add a battery? What happens if you've got solar? What, happy, what happens if you've got third party devices in the home heating the hot water? It's all, they're all gonna be struggling over the power um, that's used for the car. And we just really feel that the whole thing needs to work in a really nice ecosystem. And the customer doesn't need to have to think about it too much, just to plug in and let the products do, do their work and do their thing and know that the main fuse isn't gonna to get too hot, know that they're gonna charge when it's the cheapest tariff, you know, um, know that if a, a, a shower's turned on in the home that the car will hold off until there's more available. It, there's so much that you can do with sort of smart charging and smart home management. And really that is our big differentiator and is what has helped catapult us, catapult our growth really. Yeah, you just touched on partnerships there. You said you were the first movers with this product, but since then, have any other companies approached you about joining forces or are you still keen on remaining as your own single entity? Yeah, we're very much still our own single entity and it's one of our things that we've really wanted to, to because it's so early in the industry and the industry is moving so fast, we've not wanted to what's called like jump into bed with anybody too soon. We're really inclusive. We like to play with everybody. We like to figure out what's going on in the market, figure out what's right for us. You know, it's still me and Lee that own the business, mate. So we've got the decision, you know, we've got the say. Mm. Um, and we like to be agile and fast moving because it's a fast paced industry. And I think if, if you embed yourself in with anybody too much and because we've built such a nice brand, like why not leverage that and why not go for it? But we certainly would listen to people, you know, if they had a, a good idea and there's, there's, some cool tech popping up on in the industry but I, I for sure feel that we have got like a good a five-year lead now on this sort of thing um and, and a lot of ideas to products that we could manufacture ourselves so we are quite in, independent in that sense okay great and now one thing i did want to touch on is the fact that my energy is the principal sponsor of the xi energy racing team in the extreme e series could you just talk to us about that partnership and how all that came about? Yeah, it was a random one. So we were speaking to Ollie Bennett and Brian Bennett about um, commercial property and then wanting zappies in the commercial property. Mm. And then it just came up that, oh, my, it, it was Brian Bennett said, oh, my son, Oliver, is a race car driver, rally driver. And he's in this new series, this Extreme E series. And I'd not heard about it at the time. I'm not a huge motorsport fan, so I can't pretend to know a lot about motorsports. But when I heard the story of Extreme E and what they were doing and how they were doing it, like how they were proving electric vehicle technology, how they had this completely carbon neutral race, how they, um, you know, highlight the importance of, climate change in the five most affected areas in the world show up they do a load of on the on the ground work they had loads of data and scientists um helping them spread the message of climate change and then they did something really beneficial on the ground and then they have this amazing race like this amazing motorsport race which is extreme to watch it's it's mm. mad i just thought that is so cool you know we're, we're a global company we're going into other markets and I thought what a time to just let the world know that we're here we back this initiative and how cool would it be to see my energy on the side of a <laughs> some brand new tech some innovative brand new tech that's pushing the right message so it was just it just all aligned really and it's and it's been amazing for content like i'm a social media uh fan and you use social media a lot and you know how hard it is if you on it yourself to keep coming up with creative ideas for content and this just yeah. spews it out so i'm so i'm buzzing that we've got all this <laughs> i mean how much would it be to take an suv to like greenland or something and get it racing around in the snow with your name branded all over it it would just be crazy so i thought yeah, the the sheer level of content that we got and how cool oliver and christine are it was just a, 
a no brainer for me. I love the um, gender split as well in the race in the fact that it's male and female races. Cause I'm, I love my cars and I like driving and I wanted to see some badass babe rag around a car, massive, massive car yeah, um, no, around I'm, these terrains. So yeah, just fun. I mean, we're mad on Extreme E over here and you're right. There are so many elements to it, which just make it such a great watch. I, I mean, I spent the whole day watching the last race in Senegal when you seriously just can't take your eyes off the screen. I mean, to me, it's like it's like Formula E on steroids. <laughs> exactly. That is the best way to describe it ever. I might use that Formula E on steroids. And it is. And the fir- you'll have to go back and watch the first races, the highlights of the race in Ab- uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. That was nuts as well. Like they were just dropping off this. It, I think it was the biggest drop off in motorsport, like down this hill. And that some some of the people flipped the cars and all sorts. There was flipping going on. There was like cars just <laughs> tumbling all over the place. And I was like, this is, you know, we're watching between like your eyes. I was like, what is actually going on? I was nervous for our drivers. I was like, this is mad. This is like, this is actually dangerous. This is, and so I was like, I get why they call it extreme E. So I'm, I'm interested to see what's going to happen on the snow. Yeah, and I mean, your name, well, the, the My Energy name is plastered all over that car. And so I was just wondering what sort of benefits you've seen from that partnership so far. For me, it wasn't um, really, I didn't think that we were going to get a direct sale straight away from it. And for starters, it's not something that I push for direct sales because we're already bloody struggling to keep up. It's one of those that's like a brand awareness, you know, so that even if it's just imprinted on people's brain, like it's so prominent on the car, like what is My Energy? And we did actually see... Um, we've been monitoring the um, site visits quite closely and we did see an uptake and then we, we obviously monitor our site visits in, 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 in oh, can't talk, amongst our competitors as well, like the competitive landscape for EV charging or whatever it is. And ours actually carried on going up where everybody's plateaued. So I thought it could have something to do with it. It could be seasonal um, because the sun's shining and people like go online and talk about our products so much when the sun's shining. Like I'm getting, when it's a sunny day, I'm just getting screen grabs galore of how many people have charged their cars for free or heated their homes for free or obsessed with their energy usage and sending me screen grabs. So, but it's more, it's a brand awareness thing. You know, it's aligning ourselves with the climate crisis and a really cool motorsport that's doing some positive things. And I think, if it's just planting that seed in someone's mind and then they recognize the brand when they see it again and you know in one of the other crazy ideas that i have for marketing then it's just getting that it's just getting that awareness out there um, but we've seen an increase in following on socials and we've seen an increase in traffic to the website whether it's that or whether it's something else and it also opens doors so you know we're in the motorsport world now our, our races are amongst some of the biggest names in motorsport and it, it strikes conversation it strikes interest and we're actually starting to supply some charges for some pretty big names so it's just you know it i think it it will come around um tenfold really these these sort of things do well and it and it was good because we got in there early you know before the I don't know how it works with these things, but I think next year, if it if it's done again, it'll be all the, the big boys that come in and buy up all the sponsorship and people like us might get pushed to the side, but who knows? Yeah, exactly. Who knows? Now, obviously, you're at the very heart of the EV charging industry, and so I'd just like to get your thoughts on the industry as a whole. Whenever people talk about electric vehicles, one of the first things that comes up is infrastructure. And as someone who works within the EV charging infrastructure and within home charging as well, Do you think people's concerns over charging are justified or do you think we're at a point now where everyone has enough options available to them? Yeah, it's like, um, you know, I try and always think about it as somebody that's totally new to the space, because like you say, we live, eat, sleep, breathe it. And it is intimidating when you're making a change to something. There's a whole lot of language changes. You know, you're not looking at mile at pence per mile in terms of gallons of petrol and things like that you you know we're so used to how our brain works that you see whatever it costs for petrol you know that you're going to get x amount of miles like all of that changes done it however many kilowatt hours you how far that's going to get you and how much your electricity price is and it's just like it's a minefield so i try and really like strip it back for people and i do think that we've still got a not a long way to go because i think it's tipped now from from the beginning when, when we first started the business it seemed very early adopter but now as the oems are really more and more um new models of electric vehicles the mindset is shifting and the the fact is there's enough chargers out there on the road 
and in the public to be able to support your needs if you're an EV driver. But obviously we need more and more because more and more people are going to be on the road. But our ethos as a business is home is the most important place. Like, I don't know about you. Do you drive an EV? I do, yeah. Like, all I do is charge it at home. I think, like, if I'm doing a really long journey, I plan it out a little bit more. But even then, now now, now that I've got the Tesla, I don't because of their network. But I understand Tesla owners, you, you're in a bit of a privileged position if you can get a Tesla, although the Model 3's price is pretty reasonable. Um, but you, with the other cars, you do have to plan your journey that little bit more or just make sure that the, the place that you go in, the destination that you go in has got a charger. Um, and more and more and more charges being installed so i just i don't have a problem like i was driving a nissan leaf around five years ago and didn't have a problem i was driving um the jaguar i pace around for a year or so after that and didn't have a problem always managed to find a charge it's just you just have to change your mindset electricity is everywhere isn't it yeah. so yeah. I, I just love to see more destination charging so more um you know when you rock up to a shopping center or there's, there's a charger there just so you can top up but even then the range is getting so long on the cars that I, I'd see a less need for public charging and more of a need for home home energy management and charging at home. And I'm not just saying that because I work in home charging. I'm saying that because that is what the data points at, you know, um, but more charges better, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I do think the, the, it's already fine. If you was to buy an EV now, you would cope. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's a great point when you say it's a, all about a change in mindset. I mean, whenever I talk to people who are unsure over electric vehicles, it's often because they're thinking about running an electric car in the same way that they run a petrol or diesel car. And they feel like they need a car that can do 400 mile round trips when in actual fact, they very, very rarely do journeys like that. And I always say to people, when you have an electric car, every single morning when you leave your home you have a hundred percent charge because you you charge when you're at home whereas how often do they leave their house with a full tank of petrol or diesel so i think you're right when you say it's a shift in thinking and to me it feels like the barriers to ev ownership are being knocked down almost day by day definitely less and less um even and just and that's happened in such a short space of time and the range is getting longer on the cars so there will be like i say even less need really for the, you just for the public network but it's there as a backup which is amazing isn't it for that rapid charge when you need it just to, to back it up and then your fuel stations at home permanently there and you, you just you'd be surprised like I've literally only charged my car off the sun obviously pandemic slowed things down a little bit so I haven't been on the road as much mm. um I just literally leave it plugged in and let it top up off sunshine and then give it give it a blast if I know I've got a long journey and I've run a little bit low it's just it is a complete mindset um yeah and, and which is which is our job in the industry to keep educating people on it I think yeah no absolutely and now just to finish you said that my energy is bursting at the seam so it looks like you've got quite a few busy years ahead of you now how do you expect the business to grow in, say, the next five years or so? Good question. So we are scaling up pretty pretty heavily um, to be able to cope with demand. And we are entering some new markets. So we're just about to go live and open our Australian market, which is going to be cool. Um, we've got Germany, Benelux and Ireland, and we've got our sites set on some other countries in Europe where we want to set up and potentially the States as well. So in five years time, I do see us having more and more offices abroad and i just can't wait to get some of the products out that we've been working on um at the minute we're just navigating short-term microchip issues which i'm sure you'll have seen in the news yeah. um but and our new production lines just being signed off so as soon as that new production lines signed off and we were over this hurdle of the microchip issue we are absolutely flying um so it's just and then we can start bringing out new products which will be by the end of this year late summer q4 basically we'll be bringing out some new stuff so i'm excited for that that's it for this episode and so a big thank you to jordan for coming on the podcast if you liked this episode please do go back and listen to our other episodes and remember to subscribe so you receive every podcast as soon as it comes out thanks for listening and we'll see you on the next episode of the everything ev podcast